This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 26. My guest is George Delgado, who is an original member of the Premieres from East LA Baby. And they were the first East LA group to have a national hit record with Farmer John, which reached number 19 let's see, in July of 1964 on the charts. They were still in high school, and uh, before you know it, they were on a major tour. So uh, welcome, George. How are you doing? Hey, Mark. Uh, well, glad to be here. Uh, how's it going with you? Everything's great, man. All right. So tell me, uh, how did the premieres form? You guys were from San Gabriel? Yeah, we were in San Gabriel, and uh, a cousin of mine used to uh, go and play uh, and jam with uh, Lawrence and John, who started the band. Uh, the premieres and uh, uh, he was on his way to rehearsal and he just stopped by my house and he says why don't you come over and uh, listen to us play so I went with him and uh, so he was in the band and uh, uh, I would just go down there and just uh, listen in and uh, a little support give him a little support and uh, at one point uh, he wasn't able to make it and he loaded me his guitar and I went down there and they asked me, uh, Lawrence and John asked me, well, just come down and uh, uh, when he when he can make it, when uh, Nikki can make it, which was my cousin, um, he, he will, um, uh, he'll make it. In the meantime, why don't you just come in? So I started learning some chords with Lawrence and John and that's basically how it started. Just one day into another, one rehearsal into another, just uh, bloomed into weeks and months and pretty soon, we were picking. We were asking if we could play at a at a church function or um, um, for a wedding or a baptism. And uh, uh, when we first started, we we didn't know a lot of songs. We had to repeat a lot of songs. We should and, mention that uh, that John and Lawrence were brothers. That's right, John and Lawrence Perez, Perez. 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 Yes. And so, is it true? The rumor is what I've heard forever is that you guys, even though you weren't cholos uh -huh. you kind of dressed like cholos when you were first playing well sure. you know what uh we were just following the crowd and uh people in high school that's what they wore they wore khakis and pendletons you know and so like uh we used to go to this store in alhambra and um i think it was called downers no it was called downers <laughs> and we used to go down <laughs> and get our shirts and khakis because that was the best buy and then there was a Montgomery Wards and stuff like that. So we would, so it would look like that, like, uh, and everything was oversized. Mm -hmm. Not so much that it was oversized. We we're all skinny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what about uh, skinny? When did Frank Zuniga join on bass? Frank Zuniga was good friends, uh, first of all, in uh, same grade with John Perez, the drummer, uh, Lawrence's brother, and. Um, uh, he started coming around, and um, but he didn't have a bass, but he had a guitar. So he started coming around with a guitar. So there was a bunch of guitar players. So uh, at one point, uh, we discussed it, and then, uh, I think his folks gave him the okay to get a go over to Sears and get a bass. Sears, and, baby. Um, was it a yeah. silver tone or? I know the guitarist was Silvertone at Sears. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Silvertone. And um, it was either Silvertone. Montgomery Wards has had their own um, uh, models. And um, and I can't remember the name of the what, what Montgomery Wards had to offer. Yeah, yeah, I remember those two. And I'll probably um, come back I'm to not them. mistaken, it was a Montgomery Wards model. Base airline, I think it was called an airline, and um, um, the base. Yeah. And, now, did um, you guys? I know you guys had Fender guitars, but did you have them at the beginning, or did you evolve into the Fenders? Um, I think we had. I personally had a borrowed guitar from um, my cousin, and uh, I uh, eventually, uh, I guess he wanted his guitar back, so. Uh, <laughs> At one point or another, we did go to Sears and uh, um, and get some guitars down there. Silver and tunes. Probably. Not because we had something in mind. It's because, well, if we're going to practice, <laughs> we, 
we we really should practice with guitars, our own guitars. So you started with silver tones, and then you graduated to Fenders. Um, yeah, but it was a that was a long time uh, <laughs> between uh, the purchases. Yeah, uh, because we were just barely learning. Uh, Lawrence at one point, uh, um, he would have to uh, show me how to tune the guitar correctly to his guitar, and um, and uh, and Frankie's bass. He would have to tune Frankie's bass. So Lawrence and John, they were kind of like uh, head spearing the uh, the whole um, band thing, and we were just going along. And <clears throat> his mom and dad. Um, you know, the Perez's, uh, the Perez family, uh, we would practice down their house, and uh, they were um, very, very kind to us. It was like our second home. I mean, like we would go down there to practice, and the first thing we did was, uh, "Did you guys already eat?" So we, yeah. she would always have invite us to dinner and stuff like that, and we would practice. And um, and the guitar thing, uh, yeah, we uh, we learned. Um, on the job, we learned on the job. There's a lot of uh, uh, music that Lawrence liked. He liked the Ventures, and uh, uh, there was other groups, uh, the country and western groups uh, that uh, we all liked. We all liked that old school country and western music. Uh, you played some of that too. Uh, we were we were we learned off of it because some of those chords were pretty simple, and it was right up our alley. You know, your cheating heart. Um, you know, um, yeah, just a bunch of songs that were hits at that time that weren't too over our heads, that weren't right. too difficult to learn. Were you doing any surf tunes? You mentioned the Ventures. Were you doing uh, uh, surf tunes? Lawrence used to like just listen to 45s and listen to those leads, and he would show me the chords, and I would play the chords, and he would play. Um, I remember one of the first songs we called The Walk Don't Run. Yeah, I, I remember that, yeah. yeah. And uh, that was by uh, uh, the Ventures, and of course they did other songs too. Did you and, do other surf tunes or just Venture stuff? Um, uh, I don't recall. I know we liked it. We 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 fumbled around with it in the course of learning uh, what exactly uh, uh, the chords were, uh, where the music would take us, so we could progress and, and learn more as we learn. What about uh, like doo-wop songs, you know, that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, well, that was kind of like our 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 main mainstream um, uh, list of songs to do um, uh, because uh, basically it was simple one six four five, and uh, um, we uh, we did that. We didn't have a we didn't have strong vocals. And at first, we we uh, we had a singer named Arthur Roland. Arthur Roland was uh, uh, African American. is really good on stage. I remember the songs he used to do, and they were they were doo wopish. And then uh, he uh, he had his little um, um, go to uh, uh, costumes that he would uh, put on, uh, like uh, that song. Uh, well, I'm a long tall Texan. He dressed up like a Texan and stuff like that, put on a show. And he was uh, very good at what he did. Uh, I believe at, at one point, uh, him and Billy had a disagreement about something. And we never, the next thing I know, I show up to practice and he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes. um, at any way, we did get another singer. And um, so we always, we always realized uh we weren't vocalists, so we kind of like did um, um, the music end of it. We did a lot of instrumentals, honky tonk, uh, sleepwalk, uh, that, and um, of course we did a lot of traditional um, uh, songs that our parents grew up with. For example, uh, boleros or the corridos yeah. that people like to dance to, just line dance yes. at weddings and. Uh, uh, that was that was a lot of fun. I didn't know the story about the uh, the, uh, the singer you had and the singers you had. I never knew that. Uh, but getting yeah. back to Billy, we got to get to Billy. You mentioned Billy. Um, okay. The story is from when I interviewed you guys, you and uh, Lawrence, okay, 20 years ago or whenever it was. 
uh, is that um, I think uh, Lawrence's mother called up Billy Cardenas and said, hey, you got to hear my son's band, blah, 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 because he was already managing a lot of popular East LA bands. And he came down to hear you guys. And uh, and he liked you. And that was the beginning of everything. So before you met Billy, you were probably playing, like you said, a lot of weddings, parties, you know, presentations, uh, yeah. whatever. But uh, once Billy got you, got you, you started doing better venues. But he also, didn't he tell you, get rid of the khakis, get some suits, get some, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, what he didn't realize that we already were doing that, you know, we went over to Tony's Tuck Shop so we could get uh, tuxedos and uh, and play at weddings. You mm -hmm. know, we never played like that, like we did uh, dress up like we were going to school, you know. Mm -hmm. no, For weddings, you uh, dressed up better. We put it, yeah, we, we, we did that. But uh, his first impression of us uh, is that, that that's all they wear all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's that's not true as far as um, uh, doing our gigs. And um, uh, I, uh, uh, we like to dress up like that uh, um, for, for our weddings and baptisms and stuff. And Billy, I think his point was try to look as good as you can, you know, you know, and we're going to be doing this. You're going to be playing here. You're going to be playing there. So try to look as good as you can. And so at that point, yes, under his direction, we were um, um, able to, um, um, you know, different shirts, a sport coat and this and that, you know. And uh, The reason I brought it up is because that's what Brian Epstein did for the Beatles. They used to dress up in leather jackets and everything. And he said, drop that, put on suits, look better. So it was, that's why I brought it up because it really had the same idea as Brian Epstein you know, that if you want better gigs, dress better, you know, so that's, that's why I kind of brought it up. And, uh, you know, I, the John Lennon yeah. was not happy about it, but they did it and it paid off, you know. It was just things to do uh, for what they were, uh, uh, for what Epstein had envisioned for them, just like Billy, you know, he envisioned, uh, we're going to be, you're going to be playing in suits and stuff at the big union or the little union or here and there, the Roger Hall, uh, the Gigi Hall. And uh, he wanted to maintain a, um, uh, I believe it was called um, Dress Nice or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys wear ties and, uh, yeah. you know, but that wasn't just for musicians. It was for the crowd. Yeah. You know? At Figure. the bottom of the poster, it would say, uh, uh, guys wear ties, girls dress nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and basically, that's what he was uh uh, 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 trying to uh, communicate to us, you know, that everybody out there, you know, is dressing nice and girls dress, guys wearing ties and girls dressing nice. And uh, it was uh, for his, because um, he he was doing the, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, the dances. He was putting them together and he was putting together the bands. And so like uh, he was uh, uh, in a way uh, had a vision of how he wanted things to look, you know, and and, um, and I think basically it was just to avoid any problems, fights or anything like that. Um, um, even though there was always security guards where we played at, at most places, um, including weddings, uh, not just that, uh, um, that we would pick up, not just Billy's gigs, but uh, he, uh, he probably um, had that in his mind because of the ideas where he looked around and saw other people, um, how they wore uh, their clothes, how they presented themselves. So it was Billy's idea, but it was it wasn't an original. He just had it. He just he just was passing on to us what's out there. You know, this is this is what you guys uh, should be doing. This is what you guys should be looking like. You know. So he had big, big uh, uh, visions of, um, um, and, and if you knew, if you knew Billy, you knew he had big visions, whether they come to fruition or not, at least going to like take a chance, you know, take a chance, you guys, you know. So you mentioned Billy promoted the dances. He didn't promote all the dances, he, but he would like, he put bands together, like whether it was to play at the Rainbow Gardens 
or Beller Roller Drome or sometimes San Alfonso's, he'd put together the bills. And But then there were other people, you know, that, that you know, Sam Nevada at the Little Union and Paul Carlin at the Big Union and the Montebello Ballroom. There were different promoters. But so what I'm saying is he didn't promote all the dances, but he promoted quite a few, especially the ones with, with his bands, which included my band, Mark and the Escorts, yeah. the Blendells, uh, people he was working with, Cannibal the Headhunters, uh, God, the Pageants, the Atlantics, the he had, the Sisters. He had so many, Ronnie and the Casuals. He had so many groups that he had going. It was amazing. Uh, those were the times, uh, those were the times that when uh, um, uh, almost every band played with each other at one time or another, because there was a lot of them. And uh, I do remember the Sisters, and they came over to practice with us, and we backed them up a couple of times. And um, it was uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, a community of musicians, you know, yeah. in, yeah. In, a, in a way of speaking. It was a, uh, uh, you would think that San Gabriel or East L.A. are totally different. But, but eventually we wound up playing with each other. Oh, we got to be yeah. good friends, you know. You well, know. well, this is a good time to show some of these flyers. I gathered up some of the flyers that, my oh, band okay. and your band played together, but also some that you were on that we weren't on. Okay. Um, and here's one. It says, Romancerettes and Supremes present benefit dance featuring the, heart the Little Heartbreakers, the Heartbreakers, two more of Billy's groups, uh, oh. with their with Cradle Rock. Uh, the Heartbreakers had a popular record called Cradle Rock. Um, yeah. The Premier's Band and the Rhythm Playboys. And uh, Cannibal was in the Rhythm Playboys before he was in Cannibal Headhunters. Yeah. He was probably on this gig at the Gigi Hall on <laughs> Broadway, March 7th, 1964. And it says here, boys wear ties, girls dress nice, just like we said. From 9 to 1 in the morning, it's a teenage dance, mind you. And wow. donation, they had to say donation, $1. But anyway, <laughs> here's, here's the flyer. Well, you... And they misspelled premieres. Yeah. Primers. Yeah, it's funny. You could buy a lot of stuff for a dollar. Yeah. You so know? That, that's one gig that there. 64. Gee, now, here's my favorite. This is, uh, I love this. This is uh, the Montebello Ballroom, Friday, July 2nd, 1965. And it's the Premiers, the Blendells, and my band, Mark and the Escort. Wow. I love that one. Pretty it's sure. Baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Geez. Your big new hit record, Get Your Baby, a terrific record. And the premiere is Farmer John, the Blendells, la, 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 la. Uh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, at the bottom, you can see the next show they're promoting, which has uh, Little Ray, Ronnie the Casuals, the Progressions, and the Ambertones. So oh, let me sure see that, that again. Can I see that again? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Little Ray, gee whiz. He was what a talent. And uh, so that was a, a great thing there. Um, and then this one is a Montebello Ballroom, 3rd of September, probably 65. And it's the premieres, the Blue Satins, Mark and the Escorts, and the VIPs. The VIPs later, become, later became El Chicano. And uh, that's this one here. Well, yeah, I remember that. VIPs, Mickey Lesburn. Yeah, and Mickey Lesburn. Yeah, he used to hang around with you guys in the early days, right? Before yeah, he, he, just, he lived down the street from where we used to practice. Yeah. He used to come over and hear us practice. Mm -hmm. And and the they again they're announcing the next week's shows, and it's got the Midnighters, Land of a Thousand Dances, and Whittier Boulevard were their records at the time. Little Ray, the Ambertones, and the Progressions. Two dollars. It was more expensive. Than the Gigi Hall. So uh, here's wow. another one. This is the classic. It's inflation. This is the famous West Coast East Side Review at the Shrine Auditorium. Jeez. Look at this lineup. They weren't all Billy's bands, but a lot of them were. Yeah. And it's um, February 21st, 1965. $1.75 to get in. $2 reserved. And uh, the other side of that fantastic flyer had all our pictures on it. Isn't that cool? 
Wow. Yeah. So um, that was great, man. I, get, the you know, Mark, the, just, huh? just a side note on the name of the band. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was um, um, thinking about, you know, uh, things to uh, respond to or just to add. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, uh, John named the band. But when he named the band, he didn't call it the premieres. He called it premiere, premiere, right. and and that he got that letter from some of the hardware, uh, like a symbol stand that was who's manufactured who manufactured a uh, uh, symbol stands and hardware. It was premiere. And I believe there was a drum company named Premiere, and uh, but he remembered that, and uh, for whatever reason, uh. It didn't take. People wanted to call us the premieres, and it's the people out there yeah. that would go to our dances. Oh, let's go uh, hear the premieres, and and our cards at the first at first would say premieres. I believe I don't have any of those cards, or I don't know if Lawrence. I do, and I'll show them later. I, I have a way to actually show the actual card rather than hold it up to the oh, okay. camera. I'll show a premieres yeah. card. I have a couple of those. Um, and I, I thought that was interesting. Well, well, you yeah. know what? It happened to the Eagles. Uh, a lot of people forget that the Eagles, their first album just said Eagles. It didn't say the <laughs> Eagles, but it became the Eagles because people want to say the something. You just want to say yeah. Premier or Eagles. Yeah. What's the Eagles? There's a lot of things, uh, things that go on, uh, you know, a lot of things in common that happen. In, in in behind the doors or at rehearsals and stuff yeah, yeah. that uh, we never hear about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a good point, you know. So here's one. Now, I'm not on this one, but it's oh. a classic. This one, my God, it's got, uh, again, the Romancerettes, uh, the show you've been waiting for in person, the Righteous Brothers, the Sisters, Don Julian and the Meadowlarks, remember the jerk and all that stuff? Oh yeah, and um, and then it says extra, 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 extra. Cannibal the Headhunters, also two great bands, the Fabulous Premieres and Ronnie and the Casuals. That's a hell of a lineup. Wow, you know, um, if I could take you back a little bit, Mark, uh, mm -hmm. I remember when we were doing. Uh, uh, a tour down south that was after um, um, uh, the Dick Clark tour, and uh, we did it. And I, I forget if it was some big city in uh, Alabama, could have been Montgomery or one of those. And uh, we did see a lot of the, um, um, the civil rights um, things that were going on down there. Mm -hmm. But one of my biggest memories is that, like, uh, me and Tony Duran. Uh, we said, hey, let's go say hi to the Righteous Brothers. They were on the same show. And um, and uh, so we went down there. We started looking for several dressing rooms. And we ran into them. And to our surprise, they got up and they recognized us. And they came over and they gave us a big old hug. Hey, what are you guys doing here, man? Hey, you know, you guys were playing on the same gig, you know. And that was uh, that was a memory to inspire them. Then, then it hadn't been for the Billies and the Eddies and the Lawrences and the Perezes. Uh, I would never have a uh, uh, an opportunity to to feel that joy when when a star like like the Righteous Brothers recognized us. You know, we already had Farmer John, but we didn't think of ourselves. We were actually starstruck. We didn't actually think we were stars or anything. But they got up and they they. They they took us like they had known us for years and years, and now that you mentioned uh, the um, the uh, that they were on the same venue as uh, some of our uh, uh, East LA uh, groups, it's uh, brought back uh, an explosion of memories like that. Did so, you say that? Did you say that um, that happened down south? That incident? Yeah, it happened down south. It was in Alabama. Now, I have an idea about this. Uh, I think one of the reasons that, that they were so loving is, you know, the Righteous Brothers, you know, have a lot of connection to Chicanos and Latinos, you know, because oh, they yeah. in Orange County. And when they were young, they used to sit in with a group called the, the Rhythm Rockers. 
with the Rolera brothers. Okay. Rolera and Barry Rolera and their bass, their brother who was a bass player. They had a band and um, they were Filipino and Chicano. I remember uh, that. So they were around a lot of uh, wow, Latinos. Yes. And so they, they had... Uh, they, they were good musicians too. And they related to us. And uh, so... Uh, I think that was part of it. Oh, wow, my homeboys, baby. That. I, I kind of forgot that, but I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about Farmer John. I know Billy brought uh, the Don and Dewey record. They had put out the song Farmer John, and he said, hey, yeah. uh, record this and tell me the whole story of that. I'll tell you what I can contribute, okay? Because this was Billy's idea. That was his baby. And um, uh, when he shared it with John and um, and uh, and uh, and Lawrence, um, and told him to um, change it around a little bit, and make it a Louis Louis type beat, uh, Lawrence and John got on it right away, and everybody else just followed in, and uh, Billy kind of uh, led us along with that, and showed it to uh, Eddie Davis, and he said, "Okay, come in and record it." And um, as far as I know, I remember when um, we went to Billy's house and he played us the record, the original Farmer John record from uh, Don and Dewey, which was a B-side to a hit they were already doing. But it didn't sound at all like our Farmer John or, or was it Neil Young who did it? Yeah, he later did it. Yeah, in yeah, the late 80s. Yeah. And, um, um, and he did it the premiere style. Uh, he uh, rocked it up a little bit more. No, but it was your style, not the Don and Dewey's. The no, exactly. Crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they uh, and uh, so this was Billy's idea, and he had that um, um, uh, in his mind, and uh, and uh, uh, he uh, he 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 showed it to Lawrence and John, and and me and Frankie, and uh, uh, basically. Uh, let me tell you, I think I think if it wasn't for Lawrence and John, there wouldn't have been a Farmer John. Did uh, Max Ubias help at all with the arrangement? Um, Max, um, I think he was behind the board a lot, and he was uh, uh, he was into the production of it. I, I I'm almost certain that um, knowing Max, that uh, with all the other stuff that he did, yeah, he did contribute to that but basically the little things the little hooks and they i believe they were billies and uh, right however the the rhythm guitar is very much like a uh, sloss and shuffle okay that's lawrence so it had a sloss and shuffle vibe to it with that but all the the ideas like the chucka 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 chew and the bubble 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 boo that's, that's the Billy. main song and what about the oh, oh. who came up, who came up with <laughs> that, that was that was the that that's the main song, because uh, you you separate arrangements from the actual lyrics and melody line. That was that was Billy's uh, stuff, you know. So that was Billy's that was Billy's thing. He was not a great musician, you know. <laughs> he, he was he was just an idea guy. He had great ideas, you know. And he was having fun doing it, and I think that's what shows. Yeah, he was, he was having more fun than we were because <laughs> we were studying his methods, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, you know, he's the one that came up, I think, with the idea on the Blendell's record. They want to do a little song for you now. It's going to make you clap your hands, kick I, your feet, and as a matter of fact, it's going. In fact, it's going to tear you up. Oh, uh, he come sure, up with yeah. you know, this whole thing of kosher pickle Harry <laughs> on the Cannibal record. Has anybody seen Kosher Pickle Harry? Tell him oh, about who's that. He would yeah. just throw ideas and novelty ideas. Yeah. He, he 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 knew it could be a hit, and he came up with that with ideas. So that was his. In fact, we could use the word genius. It was that, I, not musical I, arrangements or musical ideas. I'm just I'm, ideas. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 Mark, uh, I think you know this that when you're having fun in the studio, or even at your home studio, and it's going to show. Absolutely, it's going to show the song. It's going to show that you're having fun. I've done some stuff. Well, little side note. I've done, uh, real quick. Uh, I've done some stuff here at the house, and I've had other people hear it. And he says, they're not even hearing the song. He says, the first thing they say, and it sounds like you're having fun, you know, and it shows, it projects, Absolutely. you know, you enjoy it. The heart, the soul, whether it's fun or the soul with meaning and stuff like that, 
did the um on the record i believe it said recorded at the rhythm room in fullerton and it was really recorded at stereo masters is that the case uh mark i don't recall doing it at at the rhythm room it was stereo masters I, that's what so really basically did i don't know why i think the attempt the idea was there basically on a um 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 basically on the idea to sell the rhythm room as a place for people to go and that they were doing live recordings there. But I don't know if that ever happened. No, like, no. Cause I think, you know, several of uh, the records from Billy's group said live at the rhythm room and it wasn't, they were stereo masters where we all recorded. But I think that's one of the ideas, what you said, but I think the other idea was he didn't, he wanted to make it seem like it was a live record when it wasn't. It was recorded in a recording studio and he would bring in a bunch of girls to scream to make it sound like it was a live recording. As far as I know, that's about the most closest thing to the truth, because um, uh, I, I did uh, we did go down to Stereo Masters and record all that stuff, including the album. Who did he bring in? Was it like sometimes you bring in the the Chevelle's Car Club, a you know female car club? Yeah, I remember the girl in. named Margie. She was a uh, uh, um, the president of the Premier's Club and the president of a lot of clubs because it was uh, she had a lot of members. Um, but getting back to that, um, getting back to the um, in Fullerton, that club in Fullerton, we were told, I was told to say that we did do it live there. And maybe that's where the controversy was, is, Mark, uh, because I was told, I said, oh, yeah, we did it. We did it live over there, you know, and uh, so basically that's I think that's where um, the mix up happens. If you don't know, if you were not in, you know, in, in at the studio or at the rhythm room, um, um, yeah, you realize that uh, 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 it just it just didn't happen there. Right. You know, and it was I, I should mention the Stereo Masters was in Hollywood on Melrose Boulevard. Now, the Midnight Midnighters recorded some of their stuff there. It was across the street from Channel Nine. You know? Right. And we recorded our songs, Get Your Baby and Dance With Me, there as well. In our case, they didn't bring in a bunch of uh uh, uh girls to to scream and yell. He had us do it. So after we did the <laughs> record, he had us all stand around the mic and just yell out stuff, you know. <laughs> This yell stuff. So it's really funny. That makes the record wow. sound fun too. Wow. That's one yeah. of the appeals of that record to this day. Yeah. That you hear, hear all these people yelling in the background. Yeah. He wanted all those records to sound live, you know. I think the whole idea of just a bunch of young kids like that going to, what? You're going to a studio to do what? You know? You're right. <laughs> you know? Did you guys actually play dances at the rhythm room? Uh, we did a couple of gigs at the rhythm room. But I never, was, I never played there. I never went there, but I know a lot of you guys played there. And I do recall one thing. I do recall one thing about when we played there. Um, they had a pretty good um, um, PA system. It was an in-house PA system, so you don't see a stack of speakers here and monitors here and there, you know. Uh, but I do remember the sound because you could actually hear yourself, and. Um, I do remember that, and um, I uh, uh, I think we only played there once or twice, Mark. And, you know. Well, we're talking about venues. Uh, tell me about uh, Rainbow Gardens. Did you guys play some of those weekend dances there Friday, Saturday night? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we probably played more there than at the uh, uh, than at Fullerton, um, and. Uh, that was fun too. I think we did. Um, I think we did Sundays. Uh, Sundays. That's what I was going to bring up next. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Here's the thing. In 1964, um, Billy booked us in there several times. Like I, th I think three times. I still have the okay. the handwritten flyers. But um, Sunday nights was like a tardeada. It was a. It started ah, at like four okay. in the afternoon. Yeah. And it would go like from four to eight or something on Sunday. And, it, and frankly, it didn't draw much crowd. You know, it was usually pretty slow. Yeah. We played there three times. But that's why I asked you about the Friday, Saturday, because in the early 60s, Friday and Saturday were happening nights there. And it was packed and they, the oh. mixtures would play and the premieres. And 
you know, wow. and, and some, uh, you know, uh, maybe the Righteous Brothers, but, you know, yeah. more uh, mainstream acts. And it was a, a happening venue, but I guess Billy tried the Sunday thing and uh, probably didn't work out because it didn't catch on, but we all played there. I remember playing with the Romancers there and the Jaguars and, you know, uh, a lot of people. I do remember for, uh, it was a kind of a big place if I remember yes, correctly. Yes. And, and, and um, I think the sound was pretty good. Uh, I like the way the bands uh, sounded in there, you know. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it was a uh, um, the acoustics were just right or where the sound wasn't bouncing back and forth for being a big place. But um, I think um, uh, the bands were having a good time, you know. Well, the I, mixtures I mean, were another band that Billy had, but they were from uh, Ventura County, but they were part of the East LA scene and they made yeah. the record Olive Oil and Rainbow Stomp after the Rainbow oh. Gardens. And they yeah. made an album called The Mixtures Live at the Rainbow. So uh, that was in Pomona, and that building burned down sometime in the I 80s. do remember that. Wow, Mark. Gee, was, uh, you've documented a lot of things that I kind of forgot. You know? So that place uh, you know, only exists in our minds now. You know? but yeah. What about, did you play the Bel Air Roller Drum in Pico Rivera? Um. I think we might have one time when uh, we were playing everywhere to promote the songs. Um, at that point, it was not Farmer John, but Duffy's Blues. Which was a B-side, wasn't it? Yes, it was a B-side to Farmer John. Yeah, and um, and I think we played there once and we, everything we were doing was just basically on a promotional value because Huggy Boy had already started playing um, the song on the radio. It was a late night radio show. Huggy Boy was a DJ, and um, and uh, that was uh, hosting late night um, yeah. songs. And people would call with dedications. Oh, really old school, old school stuff. I don't know if they have that anymore. Maybe they do. Um, but uh, I remember it was a a place where you could call and dedicate. Um, I love you so much. Uh, could you play the song "I Love You So Much" to uh, Marie and Rosie, and then and guys would call. And to, uh, All that went on until recently, with Art LeBeau kept that going till oh, until yeah. he passed away a couple of years ago. He yeah. the dedications and all that. Wow. We played at the Bella Roller Drum once also, and we played with the Blendells. That's where I remember it. We we really liked the Blendells. We were like two years younger than the Blendells, and and you guys were a couple of years younger. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, I remember playing with the Blendells there one time, and they were they were really great to see. They were a really tight little band. Uh, what other venues did you play in, in East LA before we go on to the, the other stuff, the touring? But do you play the Big Union, the Little Union, Montebello Ballroom, San yeah. Alfonso's Auditorium? I I remember. Um, you know, the one thing I don't remember is playing at the Gigi Hall. Uh, yeah, I, I have remember. a flyer saying that you did. Yes, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I have no recollection yeah. of that. I can I, relate. I, There's things I have no recollection of, and you know, to this day I don't even know where it is. But I know where the Roger Young is, because everybody was playing at the Roger Young except the premieres. And then one day they booked us for um, um, they booked a couple of bands at the Roger Young uh, for um, um, uh, New Year's, mm -hmm. and uh, we played there. And I, I remember, oh, we finally played with Roger Young, you know. Cool. Hey, getting back to Farmer John, yeah. you mentioned uh, the vocal situation. Uh, it was because, like you said, you guys admittedly weren't strong lead vocalists that you guys uh, did kind of a Lawrence and you sang it in unison at the same time. Uh, it was me and John, and I think Lawrence was there too. Three it voices? Was, yes, it was mostly John, I believe. And I was right behind him, and then Lawrence, you know, and uh, that's to uh, get the the voices sounding a little stronger. That was an idea that was already being done by the British groups. Yeah. Um, the the Beatles, for, for example, the Beatles, you know, they, you know, if you really listen to their uh, music, they're well, they doubled a lot of vocals. But as far so as a gang vocal, another example of that. Remember the Outsiders? Time well, won't let me. It was like it was a gang vocal like that. The whole idea—you have to really be practiced up with that. Yeah. 
So that was our job. Get practice. Let's do that song. And so that the voice sounds like one. Yes. So that was that was work in itself. Uh, not work. We didn't know it was work. You know, yeah, right. you know, we just we just did it. And they said, you got to be in, in unison, you know. And I think sometimes we might have slipped up. That's why they had John and then me and then Lawrence. And, and when I say me, Lennon, you know, in, the, in, in, in closeness to the mic, you know, because right, right, right. uh, John had the strongest voice, you know. So when the record came out on Pharaoh Records, which was an Eddie Davis label, we haven't talked too much about Eddie Davis, but he was the other half of the situation. Billy would often find the bands, room the bands, work with the bands, kind of produce the bands. And Eddie Davis owned record companies. He had like eight labels, Pharaoh, Rampart, Gordo, and all these East LA groups were recording for those labels. And uh, so yours came out on Pharaoh, F-A-R-O. And uh, your record was the first one where they came up with the idea of putting your pictures on the label of the record. <laughs> that was yeah. that was brilliant. Yeah. Because I remember when I bought that record and I see you guys on, on the label, you guys became instant celebrities. Because then when you'd see you guys, oh, those are the guys on the yeah. record. Holy shit. They're wow. stars. And it was a great idea. So then they started, he started doing that with the Solace Brothers, putting them on the record, the picture and some of the other groups. There's even some groups that have like nine piece groups and there's like nine pictures on the record, little faces. Mark, I don't remember whose idea that was, but whatever it was, you're right. It was a, it was a selling point. Oh, yeah. huge! Uh, yeah. you know? So once Farmer John got really big, Eddie made a de uh, deal with uh, Warner Brothers, and yeah. they they released it to get more distribution. Yes. And then they asked for an immediate album, and you guys had to rush in and do a freaking album pretty quick, right? Yeah, that was the deal that Eddie made with them. Uh, and so we just put a bunch together of songs that we were doing, songs that we didn't really like, but being in the middle of it, being told you got to do this, uh, um, that's what we did. And uh, to this day, I don't know how the album sold or how it looked. Um, I don't recall how it looked. I think it just. I, I still, I still have it. I'll, I'll post it on the, on the thing so people can see it. Yeah, um, yeah, but I understand that uh, Lawrence wasn't happy with it because it was done so rushed. He he didn't like most of it. That's what he said. I you know I think there's a couple of sources. you know what he's well spoken. He's well well said, Lawrence, uh, because uh, I didn't say much. But what what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? And maybe uh, is it is it is it the studio or is it us? Is that why, why doesn't it sound good? And it wasn't a sound good. It was just, it was fine. It was fine. The sound was good. Bruce did a good job. Um, but uh, Bruce was the engineer, by the way. Yes, Bruce Morgan. Bruce Morgan, yeah. And uh, But um, we, we couldn't figure it out because, first of all, we had not the strongest voices, you know, but we can fix that, you know, in, uh, in the studio. But the whole idea that was... Uh, um, uh, um, the choice of songs was not left up to us. <laughs> I think, I think uh, we kind of, um, I don't want to say the word resented it, but you know, we were so busy doing this and that and that and that, and that we didn't have time to resent Spence or uh, how come you want to do this like that or not. No, we didn't have a sit down meeting and say why, you know, we were just, uh, like we say, a bunch of young guys in a studio say, you were in the studio? Oh, yeah, we were in the studio. You know, so like anyway, uh, 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 Lawrence, uh, um, yeah, I'm glad he said that. Yeah, because I, I I, think we all felt that same thing. And it was a choice of songs. And uh, basically, Mark, to fit our vocal abilities, okay? Because we weren't strong vocalists. But we were okay vocalists for the studio, uh, but um, we weren't that strong vocalists. And uh, and uh, but given the right song, we could sound like, well, that sounds okay, you know. Did you record it at Stereo Masters also, or at Warner Brothers? Where'd you record the album? Um, Stereo Masters. Yeah, yeah. We had we did everything with Bruce Morgan. Uh, uh, the uh, Billy's. Uh, um, 
I guess his his thoughts on the whole thing. Eddie's we're working together on this. Max was always behind the board and, and you know, you know, just getting getting things right, you know. Sometimes he would come out in the live room and say, Okay, I'm stand here or stand there. And, 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 how's that? How's that? I said, it's okay, you know. And uh so yes, Max had a lot to do with that. He didn't with a lot of what we did and including other bands that he didn't get credit for. And uh, he eventually got some credit like years and years later yeah. when uh Varese Saraband released a four disc set of the East Side Sound, he got co co-producer credit on a lot of those records. Oh, okay, yeah. But I uh, I think he was uh, wrote so many songs, he was after his publishing, you know. He wrote songs for some Little Ray for you guys and oh, some geez, of the other groups, yeah. uh, the Atlantics, Beaver, Beaver Shot. <laughs> I think at this, while we're speaking, Max can sit down right now while we're speaking, doing this um, conversation and write a song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how skilled he is. And they're good songs. So when Farmer John hit, you guys, I think, weren't you seniors in high school still? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, uh, yeah, Lawrence was uh, the youngest, and I believe he was a freshman or a sophomore. Jeez. John was freshman. I was a senior, and um, yeah, yeah, we were all under. Can you imagine that? that Blendells too. They were at you know in high school when everything hit. I I went to high school at Garfield with uh, Rudy oh. Valona and uh, uh, oh. Tommy Esparza, and you know he had a hit record in high school. It's crazy. So you guys went on tour, uh -huh. and uh, you went to St. Louis was the first stop. Was that a Dick Clark tour, or what tour was that one? That was on the Dick Clark tour. Okay. Yeah. And was that with uh, Dave Clark Five? No, that Dick Clark Dave Clark Five was after. Okay. So, um, so, um, but the story is once again. I've interviewed Bill, Billy Cardenas about it, and he told me this, and I think Lawrence corroborated yeah. it is that, you know, you guys obviously were nervous because you guys were high school kids going on tour and all these major artists on the bill. Do you remember who else was on the bill on that show in St. Louis? Yeah, the Supremes were on there. Holy. Yeah, shit. the Crystals, um, Round Robin. Um, yeah, and uh, there's um, Gene Pitney was on there, you know, and... Um, so you guys were a little intimidated, and from what I heard, I, I don't know if it was just Lawrence, but oh. somebody didn't even want to go out on stage. He was so nervous. And so Billy went out there and sang, right? Um, First. Mark, uh, I told Billy, I'm not going out there. Oh, was it you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going out there. Why not? Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm uh, I, I I don't I want to I don't want to play here. Well, it's just the same as playing at home. Well, you go. <laughs> I told That's him, how it happened. You happens. go out Finally. there. <laughs> you go out there, and he jumped all over it and said, "Okay, let's do walking the dog." <laughs> and we did that, and uh, I thought that was so funny. And did you play it with him? But you just back. Yeah, up? yeah. He went out there and sang that song, and then we did Farmer John. We all did during that tour. We all did. We only did two songs. But there was a bunch of groups, um, Bobby Freeman. Uh, 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 I know I mentioned the Crystals. And, uh, anyway, uh, a lot of groups. But um, uh, the reason I mentioned the, the Supreme is because when we got there and, and, and got into our room, you know, um, right across from us, the Supremes were staying in a room right across from us. And they had ordered room service. And they were just taking their plates out, putting them in front of the door. And we said hello to them. And they were, gee whiz, Mark, they were so, we were all so young. But, you know, you know, it was, it was just fabulous to see them, you know. We were starstruck. I was. Yeah, and they were huge then. They had some majors, you know, Baby oh, Love and Where Did Our Love Go and Baby Love. They were baby, huge. Where did our love go? Yeah. You know. And it amazing. was uh, amazing. So you did that tour, and uh, where did that tour go after St. Louis? Was that mainly well, East Coast? or? Well, we wound up, um, 
in Connie and Lake Park, Pennsylvania. That was our last stop. And they were getting ready to close down because they were they were getting ready for the big snow. So during the summer, it was a, that's where you go. I mean, people from other states would come and and, and stay there. And that was our last uh, that was our last stop on the on the Dick Clark tour. And um, at that point, um, we were treated really nice because uh, we were staying there for about two or three days after the tour, waiting for somebody to pick us up. I think it was Eddie Davis. Eddie Davis was going to come out and pick us up, or or Billy, I forget who. Um, but anyway, they came to pick us up. We wound up going to New York and met with the Cannibal and the Headhunters wow. in New York. And uh, so we did a short tour with them. And um, that was a lot of fun because we saw familiar faces, you know. And um, so we did that. And then we went on our own. And uh, we did parts of the South. And uh, heading back towards California, we did parts of the South down there. That's where we met the... Um, where we saw the Righteous Brothers. And uh, Leslie Gore was out there, Sam the Sham. Um, and uh, uh, it was uh, one of those uh, one of those things that um, uh, you don't really stop to think about it because it's going so fast, you know? It's yeah. going so fast. We've got to be here. We've got to be there. We've got to be there. And, uh, but we were, we were, um, we were on time for a lot of gigs, except at one time when we didn't know Sam the Sham was playing in the same gig, and um, and uh, we went there, and Leslie Gore was there. He came out with a big old stack of music. Well, not that big, but at least this big. And uh, she wanted to do our songs, and um, uh, she was told that we were going to back her up. She Ooh. gave us all this music. So Billy, Eddie told her that, you know, oh no, you they can back you up, you know. So that's why she came out with the music, and man, we said we can't read music, you know, not knowing that all of her songs were so simple that if we would just listen to the radio or or, or a record, given the day or two, you know, we could have done her songs, you know. Um, but as it turned out. I can't remember the guy's name, but I, he, I'm a big fan of his. And I just kind of forget. And then I remember the guy that did Runaway. Um, Del Shannon. Del Shannon. He was there on the same uh, on the same group. And uh, he came over and uh, listened to the conversation and said, don't worry, I'll help you. I just need a, uh, I just need a, um, um, uh, the drummer and myself and, and, and a bass player. So, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know what bass player she picked. Probably a bass player that was a house from the house band, you know. And they did that, and they sounded good. She was Del Shannon. The, his attack on his guitar was just, you know, doing Leslie Gore stuff. And um, um, yeah, that that was uh, we did that, and we started traveling towards uh, the the central states, and Chicago. Uh, we were there when they hadn't built the ark on the uh, St. Louis. I took pictures of it. It was it wasn't built yet. Wow! I took pictures of the Mississippi when it was a mile wide. Took pictures of Mississippi when it was like muddy river. And it sure did look like a muddy river. That's not the same Mississippi. Yeah, it's a Mississippi River. Yeah. So it just little memories like that that happened because. The Billies and the Eddies and Perez family, uh, Lawrence and John, and um, I really uh, kind of got a feel of an education outside of high school, uh, outside of uh, East LA, and in in uh, in San Gabriel, and not knowing uh, uh, where we were going, what we were doing, because. Um, um, Billy or Eddie was handling all the stops. Eventually, we came through the mid mid central states. Um, I remember playing in Chicago, you know, and I heard a band there that sounded just like the Young Rascals, and they were so good. They were so good that I said, "Gee whiz!" So we went up there and did Farmer John and Duffy's Blues and 
anyway, we wound up doing it coming further. We went through Texas. We went through the Panhandle. We stopped at New York. And guess who we ran into on Cannibal's birthday? Um, Herman's Hermits, Peter yeah. Noon. And he came over to visit us. And we were having cake ice, and ice cream for Cannibal's birthday on on um, on a, on a, on a, with Peter Noon. <laughs> they wow. the Hermits, Hermits. So there's just a lot of things that we normally wouldn't have done or met, you know. And yes, that was a long time ago. But just talking to you now is just opening up some memories here. And um, uh, but yeah, the Billies and the Eddies, they had a lot to do with it. The Maxes, uh, the Lawrences, which I still believe it wasn't for them. There would have been no Farmer John. They were that skilled. Their tools were so sharp, you know, for being for being 14, 15. And Lawrence started when, actually when he was 13. When you did that little leg of the tour, uh, when you backed the, the headhunters in New York and back east, uh -huh. did you guys back him on that one or later later on? No, did you we back backed him on, on that one. We did a few gigs with them. We hung out with them for a while, all the way back into um uh as far west as uh, uh, I believe Texas, um, New Orleans, and then I think that was might have been our last game when we ran into Peter Noon, uh, Hermits, Hermits, and uh, yeah, but we did about 10, maybe 15 gigs with them. Well, it must have been like you said, very comforting to be in New York. You guys are kind of scared and young, and it's like, wow, here's some more friends from East LA, baby, that we know. and. You guys probably bonded more like a family, even, you know, together out there. Well, we were glad to see someone, some familiar faces. And then uh, even though when we were here in California playing together, uh, they were doing one venue, we were doing another. But when we went out there, and we already knew each other. But we got it, like you said, you got to bond a little bit closer. This friendship of uh, styles of what you like and we realize at that time we realized we're still learning we're still learning and because uh frankie cannibal he knew a bunch of songs songs i never heard of you know mm -hmm. as we roll down the sea together mm -hmm. they used to sing that just to warm up their um their um for their gig warm up warm up their verses they would do over the rainbow to warm up because we had our own uh, uh, list of what, how we were going to back them up, including um, Land of a Thousand Dances, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but they were um, actually very, um, very businesslike when it came to that. I, I, and Frankie was the hardest working one of all. He was, you know, he was a hard worker. Yeah. I have a great. I have a great memory of, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, uh -huh. I got to uh, meet Yo-Yo Jaramillo, you know, one of the original headhunters. Okay. Uh, when he was already sick, you know, uh, with oh, his sure. terminal yeah. illness. Yeah. And I interviewed him for, um, I don't know if it's for an article on my website, but I, I went to his house. I hung out with him and really, really nice guy. Wow. And then I, uh, I was talking to you and I told you that I had talked to Yo-Yo and this was, you know, uh, years after, uh, I guess, that reunion that we, no, I, I'm trying to think, it was probably before that reunion. But um, I remember saying, hey, I just talked to Yo-Yo, and he said, oh, man, I really miss that guy. And so I did a little three-way conversation. I don't know if you huh. remember that. I called, I had you on the line, and I called Yo-Yo, okay. and you guys got on the phone together, and you oh. hadn't seen each other in 20 years or 30 years, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you got very emotional. You said, oh, yo, yo, man, it's so great to talk to you. And he got all emotional. And you guys were like, oh, man, it's like a brotherhood. Oh, you, wow. I can feel it. And I felt so good to hook wow. that up at that moment. You know, Do you remember that at all? Thank you for that. Thank you. Do you remember that. that? I do remember. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. And uh, I do remember because there was a certain connection that um uh, uh you get with these guys and uh, uh in a form of a bond uh closeness you know um good friends you know musicians yeah, you know, particularly was a kind of a sweet guy right yes 
Yes, and and in particular him, I had a. Um, we would talk on the phone after that several mm -hmm. times. We would pray on the phone, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, uh, we uh, well, well, time just moved on in this. I didn't uh, realize because he sounded so good on the phone how sick he was. Yeah, and then eventually he did pass. And passed in the somewhere in the, around the mid nineties or late nineties, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, speaking of Duffy's Blues, you brought it up a couple of times. It was the B side of Farmer John, but it became kind of famous and popular, and especially in East LA history, you know, a very popular song. It was a sax instrumental, and was it Paul Whiteman that played it? Joe Whiteman. What? Joe. Joe Whiteman. Joe Whiteman. Joe Whiteman. Was yeah. it him that played it? Uh, he played it. He wrote it on the spot. Wow. <laughs> you know, well, we need a, on the spot. He need a uh, uh, um, he need a B side. Has anybody got a B side? Nobody said nothing. Joe, I got a B side. It's an instrumental. Let's go. We we'll do one, two, three, four. I think we were done in about an hour with that. You know, I think he already had it in mind. That makes me laugh because that's the way it was back then. Uh, the Romancers famously, when they went in to record the Lost uh -huh. Shuffle album. Yeah. They went in and they recorded, like, they had about four songs ready or whatever. Yeah. And, and they had a three, you know, they had a whatever, six hours booked, whatever. And they recorded those four or whatever prepared songs pretty quick. Yeah. And uh, Bob Keen said, uh, they recorded with Bob Keen's label, uh, Delphi. Oh, wow. And Del Bob said, well, do you have any other songs? You know, and they, like, threw the album together in a few hours the, the rest of the songs on that album were kind of written in the studio or just learned in the studio and that's a wow. great album to this day it sounds great and, and bob keen was the manager of uh, he was the owner of the label so of the label and, and i think billy cardenas got them to the deal with delphi with i see with um, bob keen so bob said have you got any other songs you know and because they had more time in the studio and they freaking put the whole album together like that and it's wow. really good <laughs> Yeah, that is a lot. You know, B side. Okay, let's make something up. <laughs> you know what, uh, Mark? Yeah, that that is something. Uh, that's a memory you'll never forget. You know how that happened. You know, and uh, in your case, especially because you, know, you already had. And then somebody asked you four songs. What else you got? You yeah. know, <laughs> that's yeah, exactly. the old question. Of, and you just put put your put it together in a, in, a, in a second, you know. And Duffy's Blues is still very well known and popular today. And it's oh. been on a lot of compilation albums and all kinds of stuff. Duffy's Blues was um, especially um, successful because of airplay, you know. Uh, Farmer John uh, didn't have airplay until one of the DJs from KHJ or KFWB said, um, uh, what else you got? You know, what's on the other side? At that point, then it started getting air on major stations across the nation. So you're saying Duffy Blues got some airplay first? Airplay first with uh, oh, Huggy Boy. And so there was a lot of record shops and uh, not a lot, I'd say three, two or three uh, record shops in East LA where people could afford a 45. So they would hear the song on the radio and they would go out and buy it. You know, and so it was becoming very, um, uh, uh, well, people were wanting to buy the 45. You know? So let's talk about the uh, the other tour, the one where you toured the South and with the Headhunters and you, 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 you opened for the Rolling Stones, for God's sakes, and the Kinks and the Zombies. And, and uh, tell me about that tour. Well, it was, um, uh, uh, it was one of those things that, um, um, we didn't know where we were going, um, but opening up for these bands that were already uh, um, already famous before we were, uh, uh, as far as the record goes, uh, they were already, uh, people we already looked up to, uh, musicians we already looked up to. And I remember... Um, just hearing them backstage, I would be hearing them. And uh, they were just not um, a group that was named for, um, uh, was booked for the records. They were 
they were actually entertaining. They were entertaining. They would talk to the people. So we we were learning. We were learning from them. We we talked to the people, open up, talk to the people, be nice, thank them for coming over. And just before I go any further, yeah, I want to thank for everyone who supported us during that time, you know, and uh because if it's not for them buying the record, so mm -hmm. I think maybe we wouldn't have gone as far as um going south and uh uh or, or running into uh uh, the British groups, you know, that we ran into. Did you get to meet them at all, or was it just too busy? Everybody was doing their thing. Uh, we didn't. I, I, I didn't. Maybe Lawrence and John did. Um, uh, I didn't get to meet them um, uh, or have conversations with them. Everything we did was um, study their uh, stage presence and um, their music arrangements. Because they were playing, their arrangements were far different than ours, far different than Farmer John's. So we could learn a lot from that. And then we had a guy on, on uh, in the band that toured with us, Tony Duran. Oh, he right. was, he was. You would think he came on board as a saxophone player, but he was an excellent guitar player. Yeah. Uh, so he kind of knew what they were doing, and he would teach us. He, uh, we would sit down, and when we had time. And he would start playing Beatles songs. And um, yeah. how did you do that, Tony? Well, it's this easy. And he started playing um, And I Love Her. That's one of the first Beatles songs I ever, uh, um, uh, because it had a little guitar hook in the beginning. I give her all my love. Mm -hmm. and that's the one in case... Um, People so are there. you saying that Tony Duran uh, did that that Southern tour with you with where you opened for the Stones and stuff? Yes, yes. Now, uh, let me say something about Tony Duran. Uh, Tony Duran is an extremely talented guy. Oh, Guitar extremely. player, sax player. He played with you guys yeah. later in the early 70s. He was in Ruben and the Jets with Ruben Guevara. But and they were signed to Frank Zappa's label. And had yeah. two albums out. And uh, he played with uh, uh, Cannibal. Uh, you know, in the mid '70s, some of the club gigs in LA. Yeah, and uh, I remember meeting him way back, like in '64. Mark and the Escorts we were playing a, a house party in Echo Park, and for some reason he was there, and he came over and you know and I, I you know handed him my guitar and and he played a Beatles song. He played a uh, Anna, <laughs> remember Anna? Da, 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 da. So right away I said, "This guy's this guy's good," you know. And later on, he went to do all went on to do all these great things. Extremely talented guy, great yeah. player. And uh, sadly, he passed away. Uh, when was that? Maybe in the two thousands. You know, uh, yeah, he's been gone at least been a 15, while. fifteen years. Yeah, but um, very talented guy. So tell me about the um, sort of the racism that you guys uh, in the South. There'd be the separate bathrooms for black and white and, and certain restaurants black couldn't come into. And you guys got caught in the middle because Robert ha Robert Jaramillo uh, of the Headhunters has said that uh, they didn't know which one to go in. They felt like, well, we're not black or not quite white. and But they usually had to use the black. Now, what do you well, remember about that? We knew about the civil rights movement. We knew about uh, Dr. King. And we knew what he was going through, how he was beaten up and thrown around. So we thought, you know, this, this, what are we doing down here? You know? And when we did see that white only, it was, it was for real. Black only, white only, you know, it was for real. And so you could question, where do we go? Being right in the middle of this or not being white or African American. Um, but at any rate, um, we didn't, Mark, we didn't find any problems with us going into a white restroom and sitting down. But Eddie was with us. You know, Eddie was with us. And he says, go ahead. That's the first time when I, uh, down south, uh, and asked, I wanted bacon and eggs with hash browns. Well, we don't got hash browns. What do you got? I think it was called like, like little circular potatoes that they use, and they put um, bell pepper and stuff like that. That's their hash browns, or grits. Yeah. I never had grits. I went down there and I had grits. So wow, it's it's okay. I love grits. 
Yeah. Are you saying that when Eddie wasn't with you, you had used the black restroom? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we had no problems when Eddie was with us and we went into a white restaurant. Because... A white restaurant? I thought you said restroom. Oh, restroom. okay. Yeah. Restaurant. Yeah. What about restrooms? Because yeah. uh, Rabbit said he's. Oh, the... no, no. I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a, a, rest, a restaurant where we uh, would sit and eat, you know. And um, uh, we never had a problem down there like that, you know. And, um, but um, uh, I don't think Eddie ever left our side when we were down south. He just wanted to know where the heck we were, you know. That was, that was his job. Where yeah, we're the, talking uh, the deep south, like, you know. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, oh, deep south. south. Yeah. yeah. And we were, we were in Florida too, Jacksonville. Uh, and we were treated really nice. Uh, we had the banana. And uh, yes. Frankie, uh, Frankie said, uh, I'm going to go get some beer. You know, okay, well, where's the liquor store? We'll go on the banana and get a. <laughs> well, let's talk about the banana. The banana was a station wagon, right? It was yellow. It was, uh, it was a limo station wagon, and uh, we put all our stuff in there. We all fit, both the uh, the the headhunters, cannibal and the headhunters, and the premiers, and our equipment and our clothes, everything. So it was it was a pretty big dude, you know. And um, I um, uh, uh, a lot of people have fond memories because. Uh, <laughs> I guess they just thought it. I don't know who came up with that. I think one of the headhunters says, it looks like a banana. And then Lawrence picked up on it and said, yeah, it does look like a banana. Well, let's <laughs> call it the banana. <laughs> Name the banana. We didn't want to say it was a limo. I don't know yeah. why people would think we're high and uppity now that we're driving in limos. Yeah. No, we, were, we went in a banana. You know, so. Too yeah. funny. Hey, so, since, we're the talk, uh, since we're talking about sort of racism, I wanted to mention that at some point you guys backed up Little Ray on a lot of live shows. And um, I, Little Ray told me this, and I've heard it. I think Lawrence talked about it, too, that you guys backed up Little Ray at the uh, Santa Monica Civic. And now we're talking about mid-60s. We're talking about 65 or yeah. so. And uh, that was on the west side, you know, that all of us bands, we you know, we played the East L.A. circuit and mainly on the east side. And uh, so this was on the West side and Ray told me that uh, when you guys came on the all white crowd pretty much started jeering at you guys and saying, Oh, beaners and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then you guys proceeded to kick ass because Ray is such an incredible singer and performer. Little Ray. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yes. and you guys are rocking behind him. Yeah. And after a song or two, they're right on board with you guys because uh, you won them over with your talent, you know. And uh, do you remember anything about that night? I I do remember, and I do remember the performance especially, because there's a lot of negative stuff that you're going to hear, you know, you know, in the back room or in, you know next door, you know, and uh, so we kind of I kind of faced that out because I was more concentrated on doing the gig playing my music because I was a limited musician, you know. I only played rhythm and I knew I had a backup, not just Little Ray, but Lawrence and John and play with them, you know, not fumbling and guessing. But I I um but I think uh, uh Lawrence mentioned that he heard a few years and you know uh, things like that. But once we got going, all of a sudden one person starts clapping and another and another one. And they totally got into it. And that's because of the the, acu the combination of things, the acoustics of the room. Um, uh, the acoustics of the room, I think, had a lot to do with our performance and um, Lil Ray's skills and talent. And Lawrence, who uh, never missed, and John, who never missed a beat, you know. And uh, if I may add one more thing about in that same subject, I remember playing in. I don't remember. Uh, you remember Bobby Hebb or uh, yeah, yeah, Sunny, yeah. Sunny, and uh, oh, the sunshine. There you go. And uh, we did a gig there, and it was a packed house. After the gig, <clears throat> some girls came to get some, and guys, and 
um, with their girlfriends. They come to get some autographs. We were backstage. And uh, and uh, so we're doing autographs back there. And she says, um, this is the first time that a white crowd and a Mexican crowd ever got together in the same room. Wow. Yeah. And this was in Texas. And I never forget that because they were, they were, they were mingling like they knew each other, like they'd done them many times before. But I remember her saying that uh, this is the first time the whites and the Mexicans ever got together and danced together at a dance, you know. Yeah, and that and that note, um, did you guys ever play the El Monte Legion Stadium? Yes. Now, I heard that that was like that, that you'd have blacks, whites, and Mexicans all together. I mean, did you see that? Um, I I remember, but I think it's the older the older uh, folks, um, uh, the people that went to go there have fun and stuff like that, just see what it's like. Uh, I I I didn't see any of that. Uh, what I saw was outside where whites and Mexicans were banging on each other, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> they weren't getting yeah. along. Yeah, and uh, they um, they just went off, and then after they got tired, they went home. You know, yes. they couldn't. Ten years later, they couldn't find out. They couldn't realize what they were uh, fighting about. You know, you know. So I never uh, played the El uh, Monte Legion Stadium. I never, never even went there, and it got torn down at some point. Uh, it's a post office. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so then, after the success of Farmer John and those tours. Um, oh, by the way, let's talk about you were on the Dick Clark show. You were on freaking American Bandstand. Okay, let's talk about that. Was that were you guys nervous on that national TV? Um, actually, it was so well coordinated. We didn't. We we weren't. We weren't. Uh, I think the anticipation of it, it, it kind of like, but not to the point where. Oh, I'm so nervous. I don't want to go on. Uh, Billy, you go on. Yeah. <laughs> but was that when uh, it was uh, sh shot in Philadelphia before you moved to L.A.? Or were you, was it, did you do it? No, before? this was in L.A. This okay. was on Prospect Street. I've seen the clip of that. It's on YouTube. Uh, anybody out there, if you want to see it, premieres on uh, the Dick Clark Show, American Bandstand. And you guys were cool because I remember he interviewed you and you guys answered and you didn't seem nervous. Yeah, we were, um, I think... Uh, Still between, um, still between very shy and humble, and trying to, um, um, you know, uh, fill in the gaps as far as questions go and stuff like that. The questions were very simple, you know. But and, you didn't uh, seem nervous, and you know, if you're nervous, I don't care how simple the question is. You know, I might have a shaky voice or seem uh, nervous, but you guys didn't seem that way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, did you do any other big TV shows, national shows during uh, the Farmer John time? Uh, we did um, the KHJ 9th Street West. Yeah, that was local. Uh, Lloyd, I believe it was Lloyd Taxton. Right. Very uh, popular. We did that. We did a couple on our tour um, when with with uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters, where we came as a package group, and, and they had a... Uh, we did Farmer John. They did Land of a Thousand Dances, and um, uh, there was a couple of uh, places where we ran into other artists that were waiting to do a film on for their hit songs, you know. And and at this point, so many years behind, I I can't remember the names, but I remember the songs. Baby, I'm yours. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Barbara Lewis is that Barbara sure? Lewis when she just broke out when she when she, when it just broke out and then um, uh, another one here uh, and we met her she was only on the Dick Clark tour for a couple of stops um, she was she was pretty she was a pretty um, young black girl I can when you did those shows including American Bandstand. Usually in those days, people were lip syncing. Did you guys lip sync rather than play live? Oh yeah, yeah, we lip synced, and uh, yeah, we uh, we didn't. Uh, uh, I think John set up a basic set of drums um, and our guitars, and um, that was it. You know, and 
and yeah. we lip sync to the uh, to the track. Yeah, yeah. So after the, all the success of Farmer John and the tours, you guys continued to record a little bit. I know you recorded a, a single on a, a Maxi Bias song, Get Off This Plane. Did you do that? Uh, that was later on. Uh, yeah. But at first, a follow-up was called a song called by Max Shubel. It's called Annie Oakley. Oh, yeah. So that was the follow-up. That was a sequel to Farmer John, Annie Oakley. Yeah. It had the, I believe it even had the O-O or something like that. You say that O-O. Uh -huh, yeah. And um, I uh, that and... Uh, uh, the old sequel, right? After uh, Land of a Thousand Dances by Cattle Blood Headhunters, their follow-up was... Now, nini, now, nini, now, now, nini. Wow. They tried to, you know, again, it was similar to Land of a Thousand Dances. Yeah. And uh, that's often a mistake when you make it so close to the hit, it rarely hits again. It just goes to show you never know what's going to hit. Who would that's, know, Farmer John? You know? Yeah. Who would know? And anyway, um, uh, we did that and uh, other songs. John did a song called um, by Chick Carlton. Uh, I forget the name of the song, but John went over there and he did the song. But Mark, uh, I think the door was closing and um, something to do with the distribution when Warner Brothers took over and other distributors were um, already geared up to uh, uh, distribute the song. But then Eddie gave the rights to distribute to uh, Warner Brothers. And which was uh, worldwide. And, uh, and now the Vietnam War comes into play. Of course, it had already been going on, but yeah. Lawrence wound up in Vietnam in combat. Frankie. And how about any of the other guys get drafted? Frankie. Frankie Zuniga, the bass player. Did he go to Vietnam too? Yeah. Yeah, he was out there in Vietnam. And um, uh, that's funny. Some of his cousins too, Frankie's cousins were over there. And they were... Um, uh, I believe they used to call them rug rats or rug, or, or they used to go into caves and to see if any enemies were down there. And I talked to his cousin one time. He said he was so scared. He was so scared because you never know what you're going to step on or who's there in the dark. In fact, I hear, have it here in my notes from the interview I did uh, 20 years ago with you guys. Uh, uh, Frank Zunica was drafted and went to Vietnam where he was assigned to artillery okay. and he was replaced by Billy Watson on, on bass. Right. He was a good that's, bass player, formerly of the Rhythm Playboys. In 1968, Lawrence was drafted and also went to Vietnam where he was a machine gunner in a ground unit. So these guys were in serious combat, you know. There was, that ended the premieres. That was uh, that was um, um, uh uh, I think it was uh, the songs weren't the songs weren't uh, selling. And getting back to uh, Max's song, uh, "Get on This Plane," I co-wrote that song, and oh. uh, and uh, he uh, that song didn't do anything, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, Max is uh, uh, told me to go ahead and register with with. ASCAP or BMI, and I did because he was getting checks for get on this plane, and I uh, says go on and do it so you can get a couple of pennies, you know, and uh, so I did, and that's been a few years. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't make enough to uh, um, quit my day job, but uh, um, need some money. I get a few checks, and uh, some of them are kind of pretty big. And, yeah, it's been on. It's been on some compilations, and uh, you know, people know that song. Yeah, and but it was because Max must have told me about twenty times to register, register. You know, because he's getting checks already. Well, you know, but again, you know, the the, your, the popularity was waning. You know, yeah, what reason? Whether the company distribution or whatever. But again, it was the Vietnam War that ended it because once they were gone, they were gone. You know what I mean? And did you you and uh, um, John didn't get drafted, or what happened with you and John? We at that point they got went into the numbers. Oh, the, numbers. the lottery! That's what happened to me. The lottery and um, the lottery, and um, uh, if you selected a big number or a little number, you wouldn't get drafted. Yeah, if you got a low number, you're going to get drafted. I was lucky. 
I was one A for a whole year, and I came up wow. with number three twenty four. There was no way they were going to get to that. Wow. So I was. Uh, wow. I, I I wasn't one A. I was a uh, uh, one F or something. Only in case of war mm -hmm. in the United States, and um, so. But I got a big number, and I didn't. Uh, well, that's funny. Probably they they didn't consider. Remember, they didn't consider Vietnam a war because it was a they called oh. it a conflict. It wasn't like World War One, World War Two. It was this. I forgot what they called it. It wasn't officially a war. Um, yeah, it's all about Crazy. what they call democracy or the lack of. Yeah. And, um, yeah, um, they probably had more to do with the natural resources, like most wars. Well, they say war is a good money maker. Oh, yeah. and plus it's profitable for the yeah you know, the big money people. Corporations, anyway. military industrial complex, like Dwight Eisenhower said, beware of that. It's still there. Uh, you know. uh, I, but we're getting real political here, but hey, why not? You know? Yeah, and, and it was sure. And Lawrence would come on leave and uh, we'd have a couple of jam sessions, you know. Um, and, but that was, you're right, that was the end because uh, Lawrence was the leader of the band. He, Him and John uh, started the band, it was their band, you know. You know, we might say now that, that John Perez just passed away about six months ago, very recently. Yes. And um, and Billy Cardenas passed away last year. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, in uh, the mid-90s, I have a great memory of this. Uh, there was a big reunion of all of us. It was at uh, Lawrence's house in, where was it, Ontario? Where was it? It was Ontario, yeah. yeah. And I went with Chan Romero, just uh, of hippie, oh. hippie shake fame. Chan and I went down there to his house, and all original four premieres were there. Frank Zunig even came. All three surviving original headhunters came: Yo Yo, Rabbit, and Scar. Uh, uh, there was the bass player from the Jaguars. Uh, what's his name? Tony Carroll, I believe. Yeah. Um, me. Uh, Rudy Valona of the Blendells. Mm -hmm. uh, there were just so many East LA musicians that showed up for that. Ernie Hernandez, my my drummer from all the, my groups in the 60s, he came down and he videotapes them. So I have some videotape of it that I need to get. Wow. I need to get it on uh, on YouTube. Anyway, so the, the, there were some great things. So in this house, Cannibal and the Headhunters, the original guys, sang Land of a Thousand Dances with us backing them up, you know. And they actually got down on the ground and did the rowboat, you know, in the living room. <laughs> so they're doing their hit record in the living room just for like 20 people or whoever many were in there. And then you, you guys did Farmer John, you know, and uh, I got to jam with uh, Rudy Valona and Andy Tesso. Andy Tesso of the Romancers was there. And Andy, I looked up to him when I was starting out. He was a big influence. Rudy Valona was a big influence. Right. Yeah. But it, I used to go to his house and he'd show me some licks and Wow. So they were like a couple of years older than me. And, and uh, so to be able to jam with the two of them, it was the three of us. Uh, I have that on video as well. Uh, it was, was a thrill. So you were at that event too, right? I was at that event and uh, I, I saw um, uh, the guys there that I hadn't seen in years. And I know Yo-Yo was already sick. And um, and I uh, just uh, had, a, had a good Good memory walk, good, good walk down memory lane. And you knew Chan because uh, you guys had backed him up on an album before that, right? I knew Chan, and I didn't back him up on the album. Oh, you I weren't on that album. I didn't go there. I didn't go to that one. But, but you, how did you know him? Did you do other things with him? Chan, I knew Chan because we did a gig that um, that uh, that um, Art Hernandez put together in Irwindale. And he invited Shan to play there. And I knew at that point, I started knowing who Shan was and the hippie, hippie shake story. Yeah. And especially when the uh, Beatles uh, uh, recorded his song. Yeah. You know? Did you back him up on that gig? Um, I, he, I believe he had his own band. Mm -hmm. and, you know, being a singer, as strong as he was, he really didn't need a lot of backing up bands. I know. What a voice that is. Yeah, he's got a he's got a killer voice, you know. And uh, but uh, other than that, I'm kind of um, uh, 
in touch with him and not so, but over the years, it's just too many gaps of not staying in touch, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but I um, uh, I remember him fondly. Yeah, he's a great guy. Still, still around, man. He lives not too far from me, just a couple of miles. Yeah. Um. So then I, I remember I, I interviewed you guys for a, a museum project I was working on. It was a Seattle museum called Experience Music Project. It was right. a huge thing called American Savor, Latinos in U.S. Popular Music. Uh -huh. And uh, I loaned the museum a lot of my old band cards and flyers and album covers. And they asked me to interview about a dozen uh, uh, artists and uh, on videotape for their archives. And I invited and I interviewed you guys over at uh, the theater studio. And uh, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And I interviewed Little Ray and you know a bunch of people and uh, yeah. um, Trini Lopez and uh, uh -huh. you know um, Fred Sanchez of El Chicano and the I believe the Salas brothers. So anyway, but I remember interviewing you guys for that. Uh, do you remember that time? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was great. It was it was uh, it was not Frank. It was just uh, Lawrence, John, and you. Yeah, yeah, uh, and. Uh, uh, let's see. Did I mention that Frank Zuniga passed already? Uh, not yet. No. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we should also mention that Frank Zuniga, the original bass player of the Premiers, passed away, uh, I think it was around 2010. Yes. And, uh, yeah. There was a, an event for him, and I believe Lawrence's wife had passed. And so yeah. It was a combination event for both of them and their families. Yeah. And we played at the Paramount Ballroom. Were you at that event? Uh, I I didn't go to that one. Yeah. Well, that was I, great. I I never get sick. I never get the flu. But that week, I had the flu, and I remember it was cold and raining. Yes. And uh, I I I thought maybe if I go, I'm not gonna make it back. You know? oh, if you if you weren't sick, you probably would have been there. I'm sure. Yeah. And, but uh, uh, everybody, that's another great reunion act because everybody was there, guys from the Midnighters and yeah, that's the my Masters and, you know, Blendells, right. Mike Rincon was there. and uh, We played, Mark and the Escorts played. Uh, wow. So many bands played and uh, it was fantastic, you know. So oh, that's great. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, my understanding is a lot of people went to that event. Oh, it was packed. Where um, well, Frankie and Annie uh, had passed away. And I believe they passed away within two weeks of each other. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I remember, like, we did a set, uh, Mark and the Escorts, and on one song, we did La La La, and uh, Mike Rincon came up and played with us. So that was cool. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. As, a matter fact, as a matter of fact, I just talked to Sal Murillo yesterday, uh, the lead singer of the Blendells. Yeah. And I told him that I'm going to be singing... Uh, La 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 with Los Lobos next week in three shows. So he wow. was very happy to hear that his song, uh, his recording is living on like that. He was happy about that. But he's doing great. You know, he's, uh, you know. He's still got it, huh? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's still, uh, you know. He also went to Vietnam. You know, he was in Green Beret and uh, he had a, a military, uh, you know, he had a military related job for a career after that. Oh. Uh, he can't sing anymore. He's, he was battling throat cancer for a while. Oh, he's okay now, but he's uh, in good spirits and uh, he's still around. And he's got a lot of memorabilia too that uh, he's going to loan me for this museum exhibit that's coming up. Wow, uh, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes uh, by Olvera Street. It's uh -huh. going to be uh, an exhibit called A Great Day in East LA, and it's going to have all kinds of East LA history and memorabilia. I already talked to you about that too. The, Provide some stuff if you have it, you know. I know I got a little handbook from the Dick Clark tour with all the stars that were on it. Wow. But I moved so many times I couldn't tell you where it is. Wow, that would be great if you can find it. It's got a bunch of little pictures. And it's just a small one, the size of a wallet, but thicker with pictures in it, you mm -hmm. know. Cool. And uh, it's got Paul Peterson in there. And... Uh, um, Gene Pitney um, and all the stars that were on there and uh, I do remember the uh, Dave Clark tour also 
they were I I took pictures of that with me and the Dave Ford tour and uh with uh Steve with Mike Mike and uh and Dave they were really very um uh, shall we say very uh real friendly towards us you know oh yeah let's take a picture you know mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, who was on that same tour was um, Mission Bills. Um, oh, uh, Donnie Brooks. That's right. Yeah, he was on the same. He was on. He was on the same gig. And as a matter of fact, we saw Donnie Brooks on part of the Dick Clark tour too. You know, when Dick Clark wasn't emceeing, Fabian was emceeing. Oh wow! The Dick Clark tour. You know. Interesting, just for people that don't know who these, you know, somebody younger that may not know the difference between Dave Clark and Dick Clark. Right. Um, Dick Clark had American Bandstand. He was a, you know, a television personality and yes, a record guy, you know, whatever, music guy. And yeah. Dave Clark was a British group, the Dave Clark Five. Yeah. They were the second group to be on Ed Sullivan after the Beatles. They were the second group that came over in the British invasion. That's and had right. a few hits in the mid '60s, and then they faded out. Yeah. But they were very popular at that time. So we I keep saying Dave Clark, Dick Clark, and if people don't know the difference, uh, there are different things. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, oh, I, I, I wanted to mention uh, that uh, that time that you saved my bacon when I was uh, I had a gig uh, at a beauty pageant in L.A. A very high paying gig, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was playing guitar and keyboard on that. And I brought my keyboard, but I forgot the AC plug that was specific to that keyboard. So I huh. got to the gig and I go, oh, crap, I can't use the keyboard. And I called you up and uh, you loaned me a keyboard. You even came down and brought it. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> she was uh, over by uh, uh, City of Commerce is where it was. City of Commerce, right there where they have the, the big outlets out there. Yeah, yeah, in fact, it was at Stephen's Steakhouse. Uh, they have a big, you know, room behind there where they had the beauty pageant. Yeah. And to this day, that's a huge East LA venue where Chico plays and the Midnighters and Blue uh, Statins, and yeah, uh, it's a huge, uh, popular East LA venue to this day. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I've all but stopped playing. Uh, I'll play a little bit, but you just here at the house. I haven't made a connection with anyone. Up until Mike Rincon called me, you know, Mike Rincon from the Blend Dallas and said, hey, are you still recording? Uh, not since the COVID. Everything shut down because of the COVID. Yeah, but, for a long time you were recording in your home studio a lot. Wow. And uh, he says, well, when do you think you might be doing this? Well, we do it anytime you have time. Uh, uh, but right now I'm going through chemo. And then I had a heart attack. Wow. You know, I'm on medication, and so I got to, so he says, okay, when you get over the chemo, just give us a call. So occasionally we stay in touch, you know, kind of, how are you? So you have like one more chemo session left? Is that what it is? I got, um, I just did one last Tuesday. That was my fourth one. I got five and six to go. Okay. You know, that's through December. So the beginning of December, and then three weeks after that, I'll do the last one. And then I think she's going to wait a while. My doctor's going to wait a while. And then um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this one. Then she'll give me a CT scan, biopsies, and all that. Kind of, and then she'll tell me, um, well, we got to do some more. Or you're, you're, in, you're in remission. You know? That would be great. Well, you seem very healthy right now. I mean, you're, you seem energetic. Right and now I feel good. good. Usually... The chemo won't kick in for about two or three days. So it's been about four days. And I felt really good yesterday. Uh, but today, I wasn't feeling uh, the chemo side effects, you know. You know, this is the second time I've interviewed you because years ago, I'm talking about maybe 2007 or something. Uh -huh. I interviewed you as part of a show where I interviewed like eight different East L.A. artists in one show. It was wow. like... It was Andy Tesso, Max Ubias, Rudy Salas, Scar of the Headhunters. Yeah. Richard Scar Lopez, you, and Ursi Arvisu. Uh, all in one show. It's like little segments. It was great. Wow. Do you remember that one? Uh, I do remember that one. I remember it really well, you know, because I was uh, at that point 
nervous, nervous, uh, you know, that I can recall and retain, you know, uh, recall and retain for maybe a later question, because mm -hmm. I'll have memories of junk. And then when it comes with the questions, I, I, I can't remember, you know. No, but I think um, I think you're a really good interview, man. Like I told you, you're a good storyteller, you're articulate, and I, you know, I think it's you do a great job. Yeah, I saw Ursi about two and a half years ago, where Mickey Lesfron uh, backed her up with um, Bobby Z. Do you, do you know Bobby Z? Yeah, isn't he a keyboard player? Bobby Zarada, I think. I, is he a keyboard player? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Who he is? And singer. And so um, he'll pick up a couple of, he can do it by himself, but he'll pick up a, um, this particular day, Ursi was coming. And so he called Mickey. And so they did a jam. They called me to jam with them. So I had a great time. I had a blast <laughs> that day because I wasn't so rusty. I was still, I was still playing a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but Mickey's... <laughs> Top notch. Hey, Mickey, how do you do that? And Mickey's been back with El Chicano for a few years now and it's doing great. Yeah. And Mickey's, uh, he's, he's, he has uh, health issues. He's, he's yeah. doing, uh, I know. You know yeah. And uh, he's, uh, but uh, I saw him the other day. They played here at one of the casinos out here. I, I live in, you know, near Palm Springs, Cathedral City. Wow. And they played at the Fantasy Springs. And I went down, they sounded great. And, uh, I did talk to Mickey, and he was telling me about his illness. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But he played great. He was great on stage. Oh, he's he's great. He's he's top notch. Yeah. So uh, I think we covered everything. What do you think? Uh, I think so. I I think maybe um, uh, I won't think of anything until the interview is over. But uh, right, right. I, uh, so, but I would like to ask you this question. Uh, so just. Uh, Tell me just in general how you feel about being part of the East L.A. music scene of the 60s and, you know, how you feel about the fact that you got to, to experience that and be a part of it, what it was like for you. Um, I feel I feel included. I feel included. But as far as the music goes, it's it's always got to, music's always got to, is first. It's always got to go forward. Rather, it's British or country and Western. The newness is, is what makes, you know, a, a music, music, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but to say that uh, uh, I'm I'm uh, more connected in one genre than the other. And uh, I'm always, my head is always full of hooks and lines mm -hmm. and uh, arrangements. It's always, and uh, me and Max have talked about this, and he's always... You know, God is is mindful of what's next. Yeah. So that's basically it. Rather, I say I'm connected. I feel welcomed. And I feel comfortable with it. And uh, but on the uh, on the other side, it's got to move on. You know, and a lot of today's musicians are moving on. So I set up a little studio at home where I'm constantly doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even if it's just a half a song or this song. I just wrote a song. It's called "Something New," um, and another song called "Sometimes I." Um, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I uh, they're not finished, but they'll get finished because the concept is there. But to stop there and say I'm a part of this uh, feel, this genre, no, I'd like to play Dave Brubeck's "Take Five, yeah. You know, right. Well, you know, it's part of life, right? You got to keep moving, you know, uh, whether it's musically or keep moving physically, moving your body, and yeah. moving forward. And that's what it's about. Keep moving. Yeah. So, yeah, as far as your question goes, I uh, hope is that I answered it as best as I can without, you know, uh, yeah. making anyone feel like, oh, I'm this or that. Because even that uh, is, it's got to progress, uh, evolve. Mm -hmm. And move on, and to the point where maybe the third song, fourth song, won't sound like anything you started, and mm -hmm. I, with the intention of of communicating with the East LA crowd, you know, and uh, it it moves on, and they'll dance to it. If you can tap your foot, they'll dance to it, 
music is bigger than than me, you know, um, and uh, but God first, you know. Yep. Well, thanks, George, for doing this, man. I, it's, I think it's really important that you got to tell your story because, uh, you know, these stories that we're telling are, are going to be around hopefully after we're gone, you know, so the mm -hmm. stories don't disappear, you know. Yeah. yeah. I uh, well, appreciate you having me and uh, I appreciate the idea that I was able to walk down memory lane just for once. And probably there's more memories in there because I, I, I did mention, uh, uh, all the other little things that happened, the laughs we got when we were on the road with the headhunters or the Dave Clark Five or or some of the some of the talent that was on the Dick Clark Five, um, or um, just uh, meeting people out there like the Righteous Brothers are so glad to see you because you knew each other in California, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, and so, or it's just other groups uh, like Little Ray. Little Ray, uh, there's nothing too small or too big that music can't touch or or reach out to and 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 touch someone's heart and open up. And when you're in 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 this and and you make friends along the way, you just never forget. You know, you yeah. know, you know. I know that guy's talent, or I know he said, well, he should have. And just feel especially lucky when somebody calls me up at my age. Can you come over and play the piano to us? With us, uh, yeah, I come over. You know, I uh, uh, I just need help loading up, and you know, and um, and the last gig I did was with um, was with um, she was um, the drummer for the um, the Jaguars. Um, uh, uh, Sinson or something like that. Uh, yeah, with Sinsoni or something. Yeah, I remember his first name offhand. He's passed away. Adrian, Adrian, says Adrian, that. Adrian. But you're you're right on he, you're right on target with that. He recently, like, recently uh, passed away as well. And uh, he's a uh, he was a good drummer. Yeah, yeah. He was a popping good drummer, you know. But eventually, he um he played all genres because I I did a couple of gigs with him. Yeah. You know? I um and some practices. He played a lot of stuff. He played Beach Boys, country and western. You know, he wasn't stuck in one. Hey, do you do any? I think uh, I think he played at that reunion we talked about in the mid '90s. I'm pretty sure he was the drummer, if I'm not mistaken. You know. Uh huh. Which one was that? Uh, the thing we all got together when the Headhunters were there in the original over at uh, Lawrence's house. I don't recall. I'm that. almost sure he was the drummer. You know, but uh, I'm not. I'd have uh, gone with his wife. So. Yeah, yeah. might have gone. Um, with well, you know what? There's one thing that we didn't uh, mention that I'd like to talk about. Remember in the year 2000, Shan and I organized this benefit for uh, Billy Cardenas. And okay. we had it out here in Desert Hot Springs. Uh, had a big, giant, old nightclub. And uh, I think it was called Mi Hacienda or La Hacienda. Okay. And, and, and again, all four original premieres came and you were playing keyboard, I remember. Uh, the three surviving, no, was it three? Two surviving headhunters. I think it was Rabbit and Scar with Greg Esparza and, and, and uh, okay, sure. another guy. Yeah. Who were in the that version of the headhunters at that time. And, uh, oh God, Andy Tessa was there. Uh, my dad showed up. Uh, Don Toasty was there. Uh, and we all performed. I performed with my band. And uh, it was a great thing. Some of that's on videotape as well. What do you remember about that day? What I remember that uh, that I, I I got to know the talents of Baby Brother. Baby Brother, I forget what his real name is. That was his stage name. I don't know if you remember, I remember him. him yeah. Okay. Uh, he was such a great talent. He could sing anything, probably as well as um, uh, Little Ray. Uh, he could play the piano, sing. Okay. Did so he perform that day? Yeah, he performed that remember, day. Yeah. He, yeah, he opened up. As a matter of fact, Billy knew him well. And uh, I wanted to record him. And uh, and uh, it just never came to pass. After that, I think we went to go see you play. Yeah, down at the uh, restaurant, the outdoor nightclub downtown in Palm Springs. Yeah, you all yeah. came out. And the Headhunters performed. And I don't know if you guys performed. Andy Tesso got on stage. It's yeah. Great, great, great night. 
Yeah. Billy Cardenas. Yeah, but Billy yeah. was 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 very happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh yeah, um Andy Tesso is another um uh, name that gets into the cracks and sometimes we don't remember him how inspirational he was mm -hmm. to other guitar players. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And there's there's so much to be said that it's hard to say it all in one you know, yeah. you know. Well we covered a lot of ground, man. I'm I'm pleased with it. Okay, man. Well thanks again, man. I'll talk to you soon. Keep in touch. Okay, brother. And uh okay for this we just gotta uh keep on going and, and just doing what you're doing and I'll keep doing what I'm doing and, and uh, we'll we'll do this again, you know, even if it's just over the phone. Absolutely. We'll keep moving okay. forward. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Take care. God bless you, man. You too, man. Bye-bye.